Hello everyone, thank you all for joining and welcome to today's webinar on wearable optical chemical biosensors for point of care diagnostics presented by Dr. Nan Jiang. I'm Kim Brophy, I'm the Communications and Policy Manager for the Institute for Molecular Science and Engineering. And if this is your first time at one of our events, the Institute is one of Imperial College London's global institutes. So we draw on the strengths of Imperial's four faculties to address some of the grand challenges facing our world today. So the Institute's activities are focused mainly on tackling problems where molecular innovation plays an important role. And one really exciting area that we're discovering is how molecular innovation is playing a role in wearable technology. So once we get started, we will put a few links into the chat function. Uh, so some of these links will include our Eventbrite page, uh, where you can see all our upcoming webinars. Uh, this includes an exciting panel discussion later today at 4 p.m. on where art and cultural heritage meet science. We'll also put links to our briefing papers, podcasts, and newsletters, so you can keep up to date with all our IMSI news and events. Uh, the previous two podcasts actually are on, on wearable technology, so um, very apt for uh, the discussion we're gonna hear. So there'll also be a link to our YouTube channel. This is where we put all our previous webinars, if, if you've missed them, and uh, this one will be up there soon as well. So before we begin, just some housekeeping. So make sure that your microphone and camera are turned off. They should be already. If you have any questions you would like to ask the speaker, then please pop it in the Q&A section and hopefully we'll get around to it later in the webinar. And if you have any questions about some of the technical aspects of the webinar, for example, if you're having problems seeing or hearing uh, us, then please message IMSI Imperial privately and a member of our team will help you where possible. So on to the, today. So Dr. Nan Jiang joins us and she is a research associate in the Department of Chemical Engineering in Imperial. Dr. Jiang earned her MS and PhD from Wuhan University of Technology. After her PhD, she worked as a postdoc at Harvard Medical School and the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences also at Harvard. Her research is aimed at nanostructured biomaterials, biosensors, mic microfluidic chips, and cell surface engineering. So without further ado, I will now hand over to our speaker for today, Dr. Nan Jiang. Hello. Okay, so I can start. Hello, everyone. So I'm Nan Jiang. I Actually, I used to be a, a research associate in the Department of Chemical Engineering at NPR. Now I'm the faculty position uh, in Sichuan University in China. So today, I, I'm very happy to give you a lecture entitled as the Variable Optical Chemical Biosensors for Point of Care Diagnostics. So here's my email address. So if you have any questions after the uh, webinar, Please feel free to contact me. So, in uh, clinical diagnostics, so medical doctors or physicians often use the lab based equipment to detect the health and the diseases state biomarkers. And these approaches and is accessible and can provide the accurate, like, uh, accurate diagnostics. However, the, we know that it is always like, it always takes a long time for the measurement. So this method is a bit inconvenient and the limit of certain functions. And to make the diagnostic more convenient um, and the decrease the cost uh, of the diagnostics, so portable devices have been developed um, such as, so here we can find a lot of like the commercial one. Uh, to test the blood pressure, like a blood pressure meter or a glucose monitoring system. And uh, these portable devices, they are, uh, as we know, like it's more convenient than the lab based equipment. And uh, they can provide the rapid measurement. And uh, it has also advantages in the low power. 
Um, so, but the variables devices has been like recently merged into the patient's need for the more convenient and the rapid and uh, comfortable management. Um, such as, so here we have put some examples of the commercial variable devices that you are familiar with. So for example, like a smart watch or the smart wristband that can monitor like the uh, physiological uh, status of the human beings, like the heart rate, the body temperatures. And uh, these devices, they are better in the integration of commercial variables. And, uh, and it, we know like this variable device and can provide the rapid measurement than the portable devices. And it's more convenient than the previous any devices. And um, the most important thing for, for the variable devices, because it is more com comfortable for the users. But these devices is not, could not, could just monitor the biological uh, activities. But if we want to do the diagnostics for the point of care diagnostics, um, in this case, so, uh, research scientists have developed the variable sensors um, for the variable sensors and these devices it matters in the like it's for more flexible and low weight and the most important thing is it could uh, provide the continuous monitoring of the fine markers in the human bodies. So the variable medical devices could provide the healthcare service for anyone, at any time, and any places. So this is the final goal for the variable medical devices for the point of care diagnostics. So what is the variable optical sensors that you may ask? So it is very easy devices. Basically, um, basically the Substrate is always integrated with the variables like the clothes or, um, or any textile substrate. And the sensors, uh, usually the colorimetric or the fluorescent um, props, they are integrated with this substrate. So the auto sensors can be based on various, various like optical principles like the such as the absorbance, emissions and reflectance and transmissions. And to fly, uh, that covering the different regions of the spectrum, uh, such as like the UV range, the visible range or near infrared range. That allows the variable to, to detect the intensity of the light and it can also test the other rel relative the properties, uh, such as the lifetime, the, the refractive index, and the scatterings. The optical devices uh, can, um, can collect the optical signals, like by the detectors through the thermal sensors, and how to, uh, how to transfer these signals to the diagnostic report uh, for the variables optical sensors. And uh, the radar devices are usually very simple. Some, some devices can just uh, can be diagnosed by the, our next eyes. We can distinguish the color changes or intestine changes easily. Uh, or if we need the more accurate report, we can use the, uh, like the photospectrometers. Or even recently, we can develop the smartphone apps that can uh, translate the optical signals uh, signals to the for the diagnostics and and compare this uh, so uh, this diagnostics method using the variable optical uh, chemical sensors they have numerous advantages over the uh, the commercial that we commonly use for the electrochemical sensors because uh, they are power free and they don't need to use its balance and we don't need extra any 
uh, valves and it is easy operations. And also we don't need to have to um, have some like the rigid uh, or the solid substrate or electrode uh, that may be incompatible for the softer tissues. And the important thing is the fabrication is not very easy. So uh, the point of care diagnosis, diagnosis has been defined as a test of performance as only a patient that have been evolved for to into the complement to conventional lab three diagnostic the diagnostics by the comfortable or either use measurement. And uh, so here I I will summarize the current variable optical optical sensors for the point of care diagnostics. Uh, for example, the optical sensors as I introduced before that can be incorporated with the textile and it can also be shaped as a tattoo sensor that it can be uh, tested in, like the spat fluid, the biomarkers in the spat fluid for the uh, real-time monitoring. And, and we, they also developed like the smart gloves sensors that they incorporated the optical sensors in the gloves that can, so for the, so this one can be used for the rapid, rapid diagnostics. And they also developed like the fiber sensors for the body movement. And they also developed like the contactless sensors to catch the tear, by marks, by marks in the tear fluid for uh, diagnosis, diagnostics of eye diseases. And we also have the dermal sensors, the subcutaneous sensors that can test the interstitial fluid in the body. Uh, and this one can be used for the glu glucose monitoring. And the last bit, it can also be shaped to the bandage sensors. So these are the major uh, variable, the current reported variable optical sensors that can be used for the diagnostics. And so the basic principles of the basic principles of the variable uh, the variable device medical devices that detect the biomarkers in body fluid uh, for the point of care diagnostics. So the body fluid, the body fluid here is the body fluid is interested in the non-invasive or the minimal invasive by sensing because it is a embedded of source of information on the inner biological health. So the typical body fluid, like uh, they contact typical body fluid, they are the saliva, the sweat fluid, interstitial fluid, the urine, and the cerebrospinal fluid, the tear fluid, and serum, and the terminal plasma. So here I will introduce, I will introduce the variable medical devices based on the body fluid. Because the body fluid, they contain, it contains abundant information of the biomarkers, such as the sodium ions, like the sodium ions, potassium ions, calcium ions, uh, that can provide the levels of electrolytes electrolyte in the fluid and the proteins and the different kinds of proteins that can also provide information for the diagnostics and also the alcohols, the glucose for diabetes and the lactate. So here I will give you, I will introduce several examples of developed, uh, first uh, developed of optical sensors based on the body fluid so I will introduce the tear fluid based sensors at the beginning. So the tear, uh, tear films, it comprises like a, basically like a three layers and use layers, excess layers, liquid layers to clean and to lubricate the eyes. And the body, the blood and the tear fluid is separated usually by the blood 
tier barriers. So these barriers create the compositional differences between the tear fluid and the blood. So here's a table. It shows the, the compositional difference of, uh, of the biomarkers in the tear fluid. Uh, so even there's uh, some difference, but there is a close really correlation of the tear fluid and the blood. In this case, the detection of the annulus in the tears can be used to diagnose eye diseases, such as like the lymphoma gland dysfunction, like uh, uh, lacrimal gland dysfunctions or glaucoma, and these are these are typical eye diseases that closely related with these biomarkers. Mm, so in our initial in our initial measurement of the analysis in the fluid, we have quickly performed developed a paper-based microfluidic sensors. So this is not a variables, but this is the initial test and we uh, we have de developed like a, uh, four uh, sensor regions that can collect the, uh, that we can collect the tube fluid and the test the uh, sodium potassium calcium the pH values using the using our uh, the customized the powerful devices and using smartphone to translate the intensity the intensity uh, values to the uh, for the diagnostics of dry eye diseases but the, the this method we know that we cannot it is not a variable device so that we cannot provide the continuous continuous and the real time monitoring uh, so based on the previous devices that we have developed the, the contact lens sensors the contact lens sensors so these sensors contact lens sensors is a micro Fluidic sensors that we we have developed the multiple sensor regions, uh, and these sensor regions uh, can detect the biomarker different biomarkers in the tear fluid using the uh, micro channels, uh, create the micro channels in the contact sensors, such as the um, pH uh, such as the pH values, and we can detect the pH values ranging from 5, 5 to 9.0. And it's a large range uh, that covers, covers the physiological range in the tear fluid. And we can also detect the sodium, the potassium, the calcium, magnesium, and in ions um, levels in the human tear fluid by the through the Florence intensity difference that we can detect using the smartphone, uh, using the through the portable optical devices, and then this and these values uh, can be cropped. Uh, images can be cropped from the smartphone apps, and the values can be translated using the app. And this is our developed smartphone apps that can. Um, be used for the point of care diagnostics of the dry eye diseases. And uh, at the previous slide, as I showed the intensity difference, and then these are smartphone devices, and we can quickly convert uh, convert to the real values, uh, real like concentrations in the tear fluid, in the test of tear fluid, that can give you the diagnostics uh, report to uh, tell you that if you have already got the dry eye disease or not. Mm, yeah, so, uh, but the, the issue is that um, that one, we can provide the real-time monitoring, uh, but this method has the, the drawbacks because it cannot provide the, the continuous monitoring because the value cannot be go back to the, from the high value to low value. So here we we just learn from the nature and we develop the holographic uh, optical sensors. So these sensors, uh, so these sensors is valuing the real time monitoring. So from the nature, we found that the uh, the ear uh, the beetle the beetles can change their colors with the uh, change of the hum 
uh, environmental humidities and the white color changes because we found that the deduction peak shifted uh, as the humidity changes. Um, so we have we look into the uh, structure micro and the nanostructure of the air tree. We found that the one the one dimensional photonic structures of the air trees. So learn from these phenomena and we created we are we are thinking to create the similar structures and to create the, the sensors, the holographic sensors that could be real time, uh, that could provide the real time monitoring of the analysts. And so, so based on the, based on the, uh, so based on the maximum, the maximum of the, and of the two with the holographic sensors. And so basically, and we simulated, we simulated this, uh, this nanostructures. And uh, because this method is based on the lattice spacing and uh, changes of the, um, of the particles of the one dimensional uh, photo photonic structures. And based on this, we developed, we used a very simple setup to create uh, and the directly the writing method to create this map, to create this structure. We can, from the picture, we can see we have created the one dimensional photonic structures that is uh, similar to the uh, air tree, like uh, the beetle air tree nanostructures. And we, we can, and the, and the phenomenon has been observed have been observed here in these pictures. And we use these sensors to monitor the glucose concentrations. And we found that the glucose, at the glucose concentration increase, uh, the diameter of the hydrogel increase, so that the, uh, so that we found that we can use the, the swelling and the shrinkage of the hydrogel to create this holographic sensors. The chemical, uh, the mechanism is showing here. So as the as the glucose concentration increase, um, and the the holographic hol uh, hydrogel sensors like increase swelling, swelling due to osmotic um, osmotic pressures, and in the on the country, and when the glucose uh, concentration decrease, it is um, it is swell and it uh, and then it's a shrinkage. So in this case, we can we can use the we can find the color changes between these holographic sensors. So here the pictures we see at the concentration at the low concentrations, uh, we can see the colors in green, and at the high concentrations we can find the color in red. So and these phenomena we have tested the reversible reversible test using these sensors. So we found that like at the concentration glucose concentrations increased um, from zero to twenty uh, minimals, and the the bracket and peak shifted uh, from the shifted from the green range to the red range, and the, it can also go back from the 20 percent, uh, 20 minimal to five minimal. So with a similar method, and we have uh, we have uh, developed the anchor sensors using the double doubly polymerized anchor sensors. So the maximum is similar. Uh, as the previous sensors, it so the how uh, so this optical sensors is also composed of the uh, multiple layers or with different re refractive index indexes. So when the anchor uh, molecules entered in the into the hydrogen networks, it can increase and make the hydrogen like swells and. Uh, when the anchor concentration decreases, so it shrinks. 
So in this case, we can test the ankle levels in the body fluid uh, by, the, by the color changes. So here's the result and we can clearly see that like we have tested the ranges from the 10 volume percent to 100 volume percent. So if the ankle concentration increases, uh, increases, we can see the color changes from the uh, uh, like the yellow to the green, and we can also see the color change from the green back to uh, back to violet. And using the photospectrometers, we can test the, the diffraction peak shifted. And these sensors, they are very useful because they have a very high reversibility. And we have tested 30 cycles and the, it shows a very high, um, it states the very high stability for the measurement of the end force. And so actually these sensors can use for more than 30 cycles, but we just tested, we just tested the 30 cycles. So now we have the holographic sensors and how can we use it to use it to fabricate the, uh, the variable devices. Um, so as I said, and we use to make the contact lens sensors. So this one, we use the so use the holographic sensors, and the, they can fabricate the holographic tablet sensors. So this is the uh, this is the devices that reported by the other groups, but we they also but the maximum are the similar. So these are so at the constant the water level uh, loss increases. So the concentration the color clearly changes from the red to the blues. So just from the color changes, we can test the, uh, we can test the, the water loss in the field fluid. And this is another method to, to make the holographic contact the sensors. And they use the, these sensors, they use these sensors to test the glucose concentration and the glucose concentration can be easily, also easily detected by the diffraction peak shifted. And so, so the previous slides that I introduced the variable sensors to test the, the pure fluid and, and another examples to, for the variable optic sensors is the sweat fluid. So the, Sweat biomarkers is also very important for the point of care diagnostics. Uh, so there are a lot. So here the table that I listed are the biomarkers in the sweat in the sweat fluid that is uh, closely associated with the targeted diseases and the areas. Um, in the areas, for example, like the glucose concentration in the sweat can be used to diagnostic for the diabetes and the metabolic electrolytes can be used for, for the physiological monitoring and like the, the others like the lactate can also be used to the uh, diabetes or support medicine. The crystals can be tested for the stress, the human stress. So here's the, so in this case, the sweat fluid also uh, attracted the attention for the researchers to develop to develop the optical variable sensors. So here's an example from the uh, so from uh, from the other groups. So this works. They develop. They have developed the variable sweat colorimetric sensors to detect the multiple to detect the multiple biomarkers in the sweat fluids like the lactate, the chloride, the pH, and the glucose. And from the color changes, from the color changes, they used to develop the, uh, developed the smart app, the smart app to, to analyze the color metric uh, signal changes. And they have also tested the, um, test the results like in the old males, the young males and the females for the, for the diagnostics. 
in the bad word. And the, but the bad word that we know, like the sometimes it's not a stable that can, it's not a state. We do not always have the spat on the, like a skin surface um, to provide the ac more accurate uh, the diagnostics by markers leveled in the, uh, in the body fluid. And, uh, and now the next by uh, body fluid is the interstitial fluid. So the, the most important uh, that interstitial fluid can um, you, normally we need to use the more invasive, um, minimal invasive methods to test. So uh, um, very typical examples is the micro needle optical sensors uh, that can that can be used to continuous monitoring the biomarkers in the interstitial fluid uh, in the skin. Uh, so here are some examples, e typical examples of the micro needle optical sensors, like they have the the hollow the hollow uh, micro needles with the long and the short needles, and they can also design as the pol porous micro needles. So the biomarkers can be easily uh, diffused into the uh, into the uh, into the micro needle for the analysis, or they can directly make the hydrogen hydro micro needles that can increase the uh, com comfort of the users. Uh, so there, there are some examples. So for the micro needles of the sensors, so the micro needle can collect the interstitial fluid in the uh, in the in the biomarkers in the interstitial fluid. Then then some are using the paper based or the microfluidic designs. Uh, the fluid can be analysis on the patch on the surface of the micro needle. And, and with the micro needle and uh, one example, we can directly see uh, directly see the color changes uh, color changes and using the using the like the paper based devices for the rapid diagnostics. So in this case, we don't need to collect the body uh, blo uh, the blood samples uh, blood samples from the human body for the measurement. So this method provided the real time uh, or real time monitoring and for the point of care diagnostics. So in our work, uh, in our work, we have designed the, in our lab, we have designed the thermal optical sensor that can also be used to monitoring the, can be used to monitor interstitial, interstitial fluid. Uh, but this design is just at the initial stage. Um, the previous micro needles, and we still need to have the patches that can that need to stick on the human skin. So here, the thermal uh, optical sensors we use the tattoo gong, the commercial tattoo gong, to make the the tattoo in the in the thermal uh, of the the in the dermis in the dermis, so the sensor will not be washed away. Or remove the easily. In this case, it can provide the monitoring. It is expected to provide the real time monitoring of the, like the color metric or the fluorescent detections. Uh, we have tested the pH values in the skin, uh, in the in the skin, um, so we can see from the pH values ranging from five to nine, we can clearly see the color changes from the yellow to green to, uh, to blue. So with, in this case, we can quickly to see if the pH values changes of the interstitial fluid. And we have also tested the glucose concentrations and we can also clearly see uh, the color changes from the light yellow to the, um, to the dark blue. And we have also tested the alpines because the alpine is also the represented the, uh, the proteins like in the in the body fluids, we can also clearly see the color changes and um, the color changes. 
So this method could provide a very more convenient and the continuous like continuous detection. And we use the we can also use the, the smartphone apps to collect the the signals, the colorimetric signals that can convert to the that can convert to the concentrations of the concentrations of these biomarkers. And here are the designs um, with the different of the thermal sensors. We can actually this is the, the tattoo sensors on the skin. Uh, this is on the positive skin. And we can in using this method, we can quickly like use the for the point of care diagnostics. So this is a uh, yeah, interesting research, but this is at a, just at an initial stage because it, it also involves uh, some drawbacks, like the, for example, like the diffusion of the sensors and or and, and also the biosafety in the dermis because it's like at least it's a minimal invasive method. Um, so to summarize, I have already like uh, introduced a lot of examples to uh, to create the variable optical opt optic sensor for point self care diagnostic. Um, uh, we know like the advantage is that it could provide a non invasive and rapid measurement, but it also have some challenges in the curve for the current technique, current devices. For example, like for the pit point. Uh, the sample volume, uh, the sample volume is always very low, and the we can and the continuous measurement is also not possible for long time durations, and also the biomarkers are all very limited to test in tear fluid, and the sweat also, uh, as I said, like if the skin is contaminated and the, and we have very low uh, sample volumes and this method. This method is also uh, limited, and for the interstitial fluid, it is a minimal uh, invasive. So we need to we need to think about consider the user comfort and the fire safety. So these are the uh, main challenges for the current variable medical devices for the point of care diagnostics. Uh, but yeah. But we are still working on it, and uh, and the many very good researches uh, are also developed for the for these devices. So this work is support, supported by the uh, so my uh, principal investigators, Dr. Aliasen, he's a senior uh, lecturer in the Department of Chemical Engineering at Intel, and thanks a lot lot for the group, all the group members help. And also, thanks for your, your attention. So, please feel free to ask questions. Yep. Hi, Kevin. Thanks, Nan. Yeah, thank you very much for a very interesting and uh, really cool uh, webinar there. Some really cool technology on show. Um, so, now we're going to move to the QA section of the webinar. Um, so I saw we have one open question. So from uh, Si Eun Kim, and they ask, how does the holographic display work? Like, how is the image made from a, from a molecular perspective? OK. So should I type it or? Uh, I think you feel free to respond. Um, OK, so here's the one. Yep. Okay. So it's a good question. Yeah, I because the time is limited, and uh, so I didn't introduce too much details. So, yeah, I have. So I will introduce details from the beginning. So uh, this phenomenon. So. Uh, uh, yeah, we can see the beta trees have the color changes. Uh, this we can just directly see by the, our next eye from the change from the yellow to green, and and we use the spectrometers to test the uh, to test the, uh, this these changes, and we found that there's a peak shift, diffraction peak shift, 
So the diffraction pitch shift, uh, so make the color changes. Uh, and we look at the structures, it began because it has a different structures. So this, um, this standard structures is consists of the uh, two alternating layers and each layers have different refractive index. So maybe I missed this details. Uh, so with the defect index, so here, this is the principles and how it, how it makes. So when the infrared incident light, so here we can see the, uh, we simulated the, uh, the protein layers with the high refractive index. So when the incident light, uh, we shine the incident light and the diffraction, we will get the diffraction ray and we collect samples. And when the hydrogels, um, when the hydrogels like uh, swells, uh, if the concentration so the analyze uh, increases, uh, it, it swells. And when it swells, and the lattice spacing increases, increases and it changes. And based on the uh, Snell's law, based on the Snell's law, and the diffraction ray and the shifted to the uh, longer wavelengths. So here's the thing longer wavelengths, for example, is. The, if the initial one is the blue in the blue range, and then it shifted to the green range. And if the it continues swelling and it can shift it to the red range, and the red shift to the red range. So we can see the color changes. And uh, uh, and similarly, when the concentrations like uh, decreases and the hydrogels shrink, shrinks. Uh, so when the hydrogel shrinks, so the lattice spacing decreases. So the diffraction uh, shifted to, from the longer wavelength to the short wavelength. So maybe the, from the red ranges to the like to the blue uh, to the green or blue, so that we can see the color changes. Uh, so and the, for the how the so how the molecule like the works. I remember he has asked these questions. So. So these hydrogels that we functionalize the, uh, so here we are, we were preparing the glucose sensors. So we functionalize the phenobronic acid, these uh, molecules in the hydrogels and uh, networks. So this one, this molecules is specific to the, um, to the glucose uh, molecules. So it can specifically bonding with the, uh, this analyst, the glucose. So when the glucose increases, so uh, due to the osmotic pressures and the hydrogel swells. And uh, in another way, it will shrink. So this is how the molecule like works. Yeah. I'm not sure if it is clear to him. Yeah, yeah thanks for that, Nan. And uh, yeah, hopefully that clarifies that question. Um, I guess I have a quite a general question. So, the, you know, the beauty of, of chemical sensors is that they, they give you maybe a more reliable um, reading of, of whatever biomarker you're interested in than you know something like uh, something like a smartwatch which uh, tries to extrapolate things you know outside of the skin and um, so my question I guess is do you do you have a feeling for when this technology will become you know mainstream in you know in ten years time are we going to be are we going to be walking around with I don't know, micro needles in our smart watches or, uh, I don't know, smart tattoos or those smart contact lenses you uh, you discussed earlier? Yeah, yes, a great question. And also, uh, so now, uh, not only our groups and also the other, uh, the other like the researchers that they have also developed like the smartphone apps for the measurements. So, so like this one, this also, this is from the other labs, and uh, let me see if I can find. So here, um, so if we can easily see, so if we can easily see the color changes and we don't have need to have a high accuracy, then we can just give, directly use the color chat. Just like the color chat to, uh, for the diagnostics. Thing. So in that case, we don't need any smartphone or the portable devices. But if we need to get that more accurate, uh, that uh, more accurate without or 
we can see the result that we can um, cannot directly distinguish by the our next eyes, and we need, need to develop a smartphone, a smartphone apps. Um, so there are some limitations. So, uh, so we have now we have an ongoing project to just develop the smartphone apps to to increase the accuracy. Uh, but the the there are some challenges. So for example, um, so for example, uh, the light, uh, the light from the surrounding, the environmental light will uh, sometimes affect the uh, affect the uh, captured image or the color or the color from the samples. So for example, if the in the in the dark in the dark room or the, under the sunlight. We can get a different result. So, uh, in this case, the engineering they will, uh, they they need to uh, program to, to encode it to avoid to eliminate this uh, 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 to this like instabilities, and they can improve it. So, uh, I think that they can sort it out. Uh, they can sort it out in our uh, current uh, method. Another way is the distance. So the distance is also a limitation. So sometimes we have we have to make the portable devices, as I showed in one well, one of my our slides. So we have the portable devices that we can control the distance of the for the images. So if we control the distance for the images, we can also get the more accurate result. So in this case, if we sort it out all these methods. Uh, all these challenges, I think it can, uh, yeah, can be commercialized in a very near future. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I for one hope they are commercialized because uh, this is super cool. Uh, so we have one last, oh, we have two, two more questions. Uh, so uh, first one is: Would any of these sensors be well suited to the measurement of stress using sweat, perhaps? Or for example, if they're worn as a wearable, such as a fitness band, uh, for example, in training environments. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a good question. So uh, I have in my previous slides. slides. So I I remember I listed the the people you we can use the the cursors. To test the stress. Um, I forgot that which the respect. Respect sensors. So here, so here I listed the they can use the cursor to test the for the, to test the the mm, like the stress. Uh, but for the the cursor like the sensors, the commercial, uh, not commercial. So the reported the cursor sensors uh, for using the optical devices, uh, it's not, it's really so not much, uh, not much like the work has been uh, focused on this one. Uh, there is, um, so yeah, uh, if we can develop the, uh, the color metric or the fluorescent sensor that can be specific to the target to the uh, cursors and we can use the similar methods uh, and for our, in our develop a variable optical sensors. Uh, I think that can also be used to, for any like even the contact sensors or the uh, what, uh, respond band or the other like the other variable variables yeah great thanks uh so we have time for one last question um and that is what is the lifetime of, of a holographic sensor at body temperature so are there specific conditions uh, for storage of such device for example does it need to be immersed in water Oh yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, 
so the current holograph sensors that we developed is uh, using the hydrogen so, uh, substrate and uh, you know like hydrogen we cannot live without water so um yeah so the current storage method that we need to put in the uh, in the water and um, sometimes we just put in the pbs and yeah the buffet the buffer solutions uh, to keep it so uh and uh, yeah and uh, there's also this is also the challenges that these sensors cannot live without water. Uh, but if, but there are some um, uh, hydrogels that can be used without, uh, can be lived um, without water. And uh, hopefully we can also develop those hydro sensors. So in, so that can uh, overcome this, like this, this limitations for the storage. Yeah. Great, thank you, Nan. And hopefully we've uh, answered everyone's questions. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to thank Nan again for her uh, brilliant talk. And just a reminder that at 4 p.m., so in just, uh, just over an hour, uh, we have a panel discussion on cultural heritage um, with some very interesting uh, representatives from the VNA and uh, various researchers within Imperial. So thank you very much uh, for joining us now. Thank you. Okay. We'll see you soon. Thank you very much, Jan.